Iannici. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I had to speak in the House today because I cannot see where the evidence is where Boris Johnson misled Parliament knowingly, intentionally or recklessly. I'm from Grimsby and I have to say it as I see it. Order, order. It is important to listen to the Honourable Lady. Leonici. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I have to say it as I see it, because that's what my constituents would want me to do. Yes, I have read it, and I think that is quite an appalling question to ask a member in this House. The reality is, is, that, is that Boris Johnson did not knowingly or intentionally mislead this House. The reason, the reason if people would like to listen, that I say that is that last year for six months I was one of Boris Johnson's parliamentary private secretaries and I was the only member of parliament who was with him for the whole day on the publication of the Sue Gray report. When he read that... Very grateful uh, for the Honourable Lady given way. She says, having read the report, that she sees no evidence of Boris Johnson's wrongdoing. Does she agree with me that there is none so blind as those who will not see? Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his comments, but for those people who haven't got anything uh, more interesting to do than actually spend their time reading the whole of the report, of which I did, I'm, I am aiming this at members of the public is that I, I, I suggest people go to pages 85 to 88 and actually read the quotes. Um, the reality is, is that there were some people who had parties. Sadly, those people were unelected officials who still should have stood by at making sure that they weren't uh, having ministers potentially in difficult situations by advising them incorrectly. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Prime Minister headed all of those people. He was the team leader for all those working at Number 10 and in the Cabinet Office who were at those parties. During lockdown, I volunteered at West Middlesex Hospital, taking food to the wards because the staff working in them were not allowed to go to the canteen, and they certainly were directed by the chief executive of the hospital trust that they could have no parties, not even leaving parties, not even wine Fridays. They had no parties for that whole period. Does the honourable member have any comprehension of what her constituents in the same position were feeling like when they heard the evidence. Yeah. I thank the Honourable Lady, and yes, I do. Um, but what we need to look at here is actually what I witnessed firsthand, and what had happened was that people advising the then Prime Minister at no point advised him that there were parties. They advised him again and again. They had, no, I won't give way at the moment, thank you. They advised him again and again that no rules were broken and that guidance was followed at all times. Everybody in this place knows no minister stands at that dispatch box and knowingly misleads. They have to take counsel from people who advise them, many of whom who are giving legal advice. They know that to be the truth, but the public don't necessarily know that that is the case. And if you are a Prime Minister and you are advised in that way again and again, no matter how you question, then you have to stand at the dispatch box and actually give those statements, because that is what you have been legally advised to do. Now, people may not like that in a moment. People may not like that. But that is the truth, and that is why I'm standing here and saying this. The sad thing is, is that many people who gave that advice are still working in and around Number 10 and Whitehall, but we don't know who they are because they are not a high-profile politician. 
Yes, I will. I'm very grateful to the Honourable Lady for giving way, and I wonder if she might reflect that it sounds to those of us here as if what she is trying to do is to deflect blame from Boris Johnson and put it on unelected members of staff. And people here and people at home may find that, to put it mildly, rather unedifying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I thank the Honourable Lady. What I would say, actually, that I've had the privilege to work with many um, unelected officials, special advisers and civil servants who have been very professional and have worked very hard and are very good at giving uh, accurate advice. But we all know from the evidence within here that there were those that didn't. And we can't shy away from that. We know that's the case. So, the Honourable Gentleman. I thank, I thank my Honourable Friend for giving way. And just to build slightly on the point she's making, the report needs to be narrow in scope. It is about what the Prime Minister said to this House. And I wonder if I could draw her attention to paragraph 20 on page 71, which seeks to go much further than that. It talks about it's not what the Prime Minister said, it's the interpretation given it by members of this House, by the media and by the public. The prime, former Prime Minister Boris Johnson cannot be held responsible for what people thought he may have meant. He should be held responsible if this report is to hold any water on what he said. I thank my right, right honourable friend for that. And of course, we, re we really must hear what the honourable lady has to say. It's not fair just to um, uh, much her away when she's making her argument. Lea Nietzsche. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I thank my right honourable friend for identifying that because, of course, he's absolutely right. And I have to say, uh, as I do respect the amount of hard work that has been put into this report, but throughout, if I was grading this in my former job as a college lecturer, um, it is not impartial. The way it is written, Boris Johnson claimed. Boris Johnson purported this is not impartial language and therefore I believe that um, in my opinion that this report does not give um, an impartial report in the way that it is written. But to go back to my um, uh, original discussion that on the day that the Sue Gray report was, was written, uh, uh, was, uh, was published, um, the Prime Minister uh, at the time was horrified that he'd read what was going on. At no time, and in here, at no time did anybody give on oath or evidence that they reported that there were parties or there was rule breaking to the Prime Minister. Now, some people might say, well, he lives in number 10 or lived in number 10. He should have known. Well, actually, uh, those people who have worked in number 10 will know that it is a rabbit warren of rooms, thick walls, people are working there, running the country, and the Prime Minister is not the caretaker of the building. It is not their job to go round and look in rooms and decide who may be working and who may not be working. In fact, in that Sue Gray report, it did state that those unelected officials uh, were rude in a moment, were rude to doorkeepers and staff, but yet at no time, if there were rules being broken and they were seen. Number 10 is full of police officers, full of security people. Why did nobody report this to the Prime Minister that, so that he was aware of it? So that, yes, I will give way. The Honourable Lady for giving me. <coughs> she makes a very good point that the Prime Minister was not the caretaker of the building at number 10. But the, the Prime Minister at the time was the caretaker of the nation's health, the nation's well-being and the nation's trust. And in that, he let people down, he misled this House, and that is why this report has come up with the conclusions that it did. Well, I thank the Honourable Lady for her comments. Um, I, I don't agree because I'm from Grimsby. I can only say it as I see it. And I saw on that day of the publication of the report that Boris Johnson had not been aware of these parties that had been going on. Now, go on. Uh, lady, I'm from Birmingham and I say it as I see it. Do you think that there's any chance that Boris Johnson could also have lied to her? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I thank the Honourable Lady.
lady. Actually, uh, no, I don't believe he did. I think, I think actually, I'm a very good, uh, a, a very good uh, uh, a person who can actually see character. And I saw what was going on in and around Number 10 on that day. And sadly, I believe that unelected officials, some of them, because many, many are very, very good and very professional, but some of them made a choice not to inform the then Prime Minister because they wanted to cover their own backs. I'm very, very sad to say. I'm very grateful, the Honourable Lady. Is she aware that in 2019, Max Hastings, the editor of the Daily Telegraph and a Tory, said this about Boris Johnson. Mm. Johnson would not recognise truth, <laughs> whether about his private or political life, if confronted by it in an identity parade. <laughs> Isn't the truth that Boris l has lied for so, for so long and so often that it can come as no surprise that he's lying in this instant. Yeah. Seeing that, um, I am not a Conservative Party grandee. Uh, I am not somebody who has followed Boris Johnson's political or otherwise career um, for a long time. I'm somebody who came here to actually serve my constituency and my constituents, the majority of whom, the reason why I'm here, supported Boris Johnson and his policies and his vision for the country. Um, but sadly, what this whole saga seems to be doing in and out of the media is actually, sadly, this is all becoming part of a, a kind of political opportunism for those people who don't like Boris Johnson's approach, don't like Boris Johnson's policies, don't like Boris Johnson's plan. I have to say that that isn't what I'm getting on the doorstep, but perhaps if the opposition had a plan and had the people, maybe they might have a chance of getting into government sometime soon. This actually is about people who want a formidable opponent out of their way because they don't believe they will get into government in any other way. That is my stance. I thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, Sir Chris Bryan. Madam Deputy Speaker, um, can I first of all thank the Right Honourable Member for Camberwell and Peckham? I can probably thank her more than anybody mm. in the chamber, um, because I think the wisest thing I've ever done in my political career was recuse myself from chairing the committee. Um, and she has done an absolutely admirable job. I also want to thank all the members on the committee, as has often been referred to, um, the Conservative members in particular. Um, I won't go into the other matters that, uh, for, for other reasons, um, that the leader of uh, the um, the, mem the chair of the committee referred to about privilege and whether this should be referred back again. But I simply point out that I know all the Conservative members on the committee, I know all the members of the committee because they are also on the Standards Committee and they do a wonderful job every single time. The former Prime Minister was right to say it is very difficult to sit in judgment on your colleagues, um, including your opponents. That isn't actually any easier than yeah. sitting in judgment on people who've sat on the same benches as you or have yeah. been in the same party as you. Um, but let's face it, Boris Johnson lied. Yes. He said that guidance was followed completely. It wasn't. He said that the rules and guidance were followed at all times. They weren't. And I take the plain meaning of his words. Yes. You don't have to investigate any further. Just mm -hmm. the plain meaning will do. He said he had repeated assurances. He didn't. He misrepresented the facts as he knew them. Meanwhile, people died in isolation or lost their livelihood. We often forget that bit. Yeah. Or missed out on a wedding or a very important moment in a, their family life because they abided by the rules. And they thought that the big truth of the pandemic was that we were all in this together. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why there is visceral anger. Yeah. I hear it often yeah. um, about those who think that some people didn't abide by the rules and that those were the people who wrote the rules. Yeah. Uh, this is not a single instance of accidentally misspeaking either. Uh, many, many members have said, of course, that, that happens, and we have a 
a proper process we've had since 2007 for a minister correcting the record. Interestingly, the only time Mr Johnson corrected the record as a minister was when he corrected the record that he had said that Roman Abramovich had been sanctioned and he realised he hadn't been sanctioned. So um, a Russian oligarch is perhaps more important than other matters. Yes, he was careless, reckless, you could say, about the truth. But far, far worse than that, he deliberately, intentionally, and with knowledge of forethought, yeah. sought to cover his tracks. Yeah. Yes. It was a pattern of behaviour, yeah. a string of lies. And I don't much care for the version of the debate today which says, oh, it was all junior officials and they should be thrown yeah. under the bus, yeah. or it was yeah. the police fault because they didn't bother to report it yeah. or deal with it. Yeah. I won't if she doesn't mind. She's already caught um, uh, this. Well, no, of course I will. Thank you. I, I thank him um, most graciously for giving way. But actually, it wasn't just about um, junior um, uh, unelected um, officials. Actually, where were the senior managers in, in this? Where were the line managers in this, stopping this happening? Does he know? The thing is, sometimes when you try to take the spade off somebody when they're digging the hole, they are absolutely determined to take it back and bring a pitchfork and a JCB to the process as well. Um, the, Mr Johnson says he's been brought down by a witch hunt. But in all honesty, the only person who brought down Mr Johnson was Mr Johnson. And I suspect he knows that. Um, I think this House feels that he should be ashamed of himself, yes. Yes. and that will be what it concludes later on today. But I fear that he remains completely shameless. So is the sanction proportionate? Well, of course, it's very difficult to sanction somebody who's already um, taken the option of running away from this House, face the music here, or, for that matter, in um, their constituency. But I think it's still important. It's not actually an academic matter, what we debate today. I know I'm not having a criticism of... of and now I've prompted another intervention. I didn't mean to do that. Okay. Madam Deputy Speaker, make it very clear that we all now know, very, very clearly, if we didn't know before, this isn't academic. Many people, I'm afraid, on our side of the benches, will treat it as academic because Boris has left the building. This is wrong. And I've learnt that as well. That's why I'm back here. It's absolutely important that colleagues follow the former Prime Minister and indeed the Leader of the House and vote to support the motion today. Yes. He's absolutely right. And I've looked around for some parallels of what you can do about a member who's already left the House by the time the Privileges Committee or the Standards and Privileges Committee or the Standards Committee or the Independent Expert Panel um, has adjudicated. The only one I can really find was Sir Michael Grills, the MP for North West Surrey, who was involved in the Ian Greer, Mohammed El Fayed, Cash for Questions row in the 1990s. He stood down in the 1997 general election, so he was not an MP by the time the Standards and Privileges Committee reported on him. It said, quite categorically, in relation to the question of whether lying to Parliament is a contempt, deliberately misleading a select committee is certainly a contempt of the House. Were Sir Michael Grill still a member, we would recommend a substantial period of suspension from the service of the House, augmented to take account of his deceit. And that is precisely, I think, following precedent what the Privileges Committee has done in its report. The truth is the Prime Minister, of, uh, Mr Johnson, was a senior member of the House, a long-standing member of the House. Um, it wasn't the first time he'd got into trouble with either the standard system in the House or the rules. Um, he has shown absolutely no contrition. Um, he chose to attack, intimidate and bully the committee, which could indeed be a breach of the rules in itself. Everything he did fell far, far short of the standards this House and the public is entitled to expect of any member. Um, the, I just want to say a few words about the process. The House has always claimed, as the Leader of the House in her excellent speech said earlier, um, it's always claimed exclusive cognizance. That's to say, apart from the voters and the criminal law, the only body that can discipline, suspend or expel a duly elected member of the House is the House of Commons in its entirety. I still hold to that principle. It is why any decision or recommendation to suspend or expel a member that comes from the Standards Committee or the Independent Expert Panel has to be approved by the whole House. It is also why the only way to proceed when there is an allegation that a member has committed a contempt of Parliament, for instance by misleading the House, is via a committee of the House 
and a decision of the whole House, which is why we have to have the motion today and why we had to have the Committee of Privileges. It cannot, I believe, be a court of law. It has to be a Committee of the House. I do not think some commentators have fully understood that, including Lord Panic and um, some former leaders of the House. So I say to those who have attacked the process that they should be very careful of what they seek. There are those who would prefer lying to Parliament to be a criminal offence, justiciable and punishable by the courts. But that would drive a coach and horses through the Bill of Rights principle that freedom of speech in debates or proceedings in Parliament ought not to be impeached or questioned in any court or place out of Parliament. So I am left feeling that those who attack the process simply do not believe that there should be any process for determining whether a member has lied to the House. As I have said before, I kind of admire the personal loyalty, but I dislike the attitude because it is, in effect, an excuse for appalling behaviour. Of course, I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. I am most grateful to, to the Chairman of the Standards Committee. Um, he and I took part in that debate, as he will re well remember, perhaps, on the 21st of April 2022. And I raised the question of knowingly misleads because it was not included in the original motion, which was then passed, which led to the reference to the uh, Committee on Privileges. But in the course of it, I raised, I think with him directly, but he certainly made the remark for which I pay credit, was the fact that intention is at the heart of this question. If you knock out the word knowingly, you knock out the intention as well. And that is a fundamental question of process on which I will hopefully, if I catch your eye, Madam Deputy Speaker, I will want to re refer. Well, well, I'm going to ferociously agree with the Honourable Gentleman, because I said earlier he knowingly lied to Parliament. And that is what the committee has concluded. Yeah. I know there was, a, there was a point at which people thought that they would only consider recklessly, but actually they found that he knowingly, with, with knowledge aforethought, misled Parliament and was deliberately duplicitous. That, I, I think his point is, I'm afraid, destroyed. I think the uh, right honourable gent. Well, if, if he doesn't mind, I'm going to give to away to another gentleman. I think the. I, no, I think he gave way to Sir Jacob Rees-Mogg. Sorry to interrupt my honourable friend um, from Stain. Um, the, the honourable gentleman is absolutely right that we must maintain exclusive cognizance, but that does not mean that we shouldn't follow a proper process and a fair process, or admit that this is ostensibly political. Well, the word political can cover a multitude of sins, can't it? Because we are talking about the politics of the nation, and I would argue that trying to defend the constitutional principle that ministers always tell the truth to Parliament, and if they have inadvertently misled the House, they correct the record as soon as they possibly can, is an important part of ensuring our political health in this nation. Um, but I don't think that the process was unfair. Um, most of our constituents, if they go to a tribunal these days, um, get no representation um, uh, paid for by the taxpayer. Uh, Mr Johnson had, I think, more than £250,000 worth of representation provided by the taxpayer. Um, the, committee uh, the, the membership of the committee was agreed by the whole House, I think, I might be right in saying, when he was leader of the House. So I, I, I'm wrong, I apologise. Um, but um, it was certainly the whole House agreed that membership. Um, fully knowing everything that had been said up until that moment, um, three of the members of the committee had sat on a previous case in relation to Mr Johnson that came to the Standards Committee, where the Commissioner had found against Mr Johnson, but we, as the committee, found in his favour. So I do not think that this was in any sense a biased committee, but also I just want to say, anybody who thinks that the Speaker's Council or, for that matter, Sir Ernest Ryder, yes. who ran the whole of the tribunal service in England and Wales, would not stand up for a fair hearing and due process, I think, is misleading themselves and doing so almost recklessly. Well, I'm tempted not to give way, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful that he'll have an opportunity to speak to the House fully later. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, some people have attacked the process on a, for a different reason. 
and I understand the nature of this attack. They say that Johnson won a general election, and they argue that only voters should therefore be allowed to remove him from office. I passionately disagree with this view. Um, I hold a different understanding of democracy. It does not mean we have got our majority, never mind how, and we have our lease of office for five years, so what are you going to do about it? That is not democracy. That is only small party patter which will not go down with the mass of the people of this country. Um, people might recognise those words. They are not mine. They are Churchill's um, talking to the Labour government in 1947. And he went on, There is the broad feeling in our country that the people should rule, continuously rule, and that public opinion, expressed by all constitutional means, should shape guide and control the actions of ministers who are their servants and not their masters. I agree with that, and that is why I think it is important to note that public opinion on this matter is extremely clear. Most people think Johnson lied. A few of them do not think that that matters very much, but most do. Most think that ministers who lie should be removed and punished. And being truthful is the one quality they seek above all else in a member of parliament. Harold Wilson said in the debate in this House when John Profumo had just been forced to resign for lying in 1963, the sickness of an unrepresentative sector of our society should not detract from the robust ability of our people as a whole to face the challenge of the future. And in preparing to face that challenge, let us frankly recognise that the inspiration and leadership must come first here in this House. <coughs> leadership means taking a stance. Abstention is a failure of leadership. Today, I believe, is actually a good day for democracy. Uh, we have remarkably few checks and balances in our system. Um, the only real check is the collective conscience of the members of this House. Um, that is the burden of our elected office, and I pay tribute to Conservatives and people of every party who have had to face a difficult decision in relation to this. Um, we exercise our conscience on behalf of our constituents. Edmund Burke said um, that the most important thing we owe our constituents is our conscience. Yeah. Thereby we tarnish or we burnish the reputation of Parliament. So let us assert today that nobody is above the law. The rules apply to all. Because every abstention is another excuse. And I repeat Wilson's words. The leadership must come first here in this House. Yeah. Uh, we still have a lot of speakers uh, who want to contribute to this debate, um, so I would advise that about ten minutes each will probably make sure we can get everybody in equally. John Barron. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I rise as one who, if there is going to be a vote on this uh, motion tonight, will vote in support of the committee. But I share with the House that I sincerely hope there isn't a vote because there shouldn't be a vote. We should remind ourselves that the Committee of Privileges was set the task on a government motion when Boris Johnson was Prime Minister, and that passed through the Commons unopposed. And I'd, I would like to add my thanks to the members of that committee for a a diligent and no, and no doubt at times difficult task, which they carried out at the request of the House. And it is customary for MPs to accept the recommendations of such a report without a vote. But if there is a vote, a division, I will vote, as I have said, to support the Committee's report. Its recommendations Unfortunately, in many respects, trying with my own view that Boris Johnson knowingly misled Parliament, which is why I withdrew my support from him, the then Prime Minister, in May of last year, and asked him in a meeting to retire at that stage, perhaps with a modicum of grace. Sadly, I continue to believe he knowingly misled Parliament as the report has duly 
concluded. And this debate, and if there is a vote, a vote, is terribly important. It is of the utmost importance that we attach a, a due deliberation to what it represents. Our parliamentary system compares well with others and is the beating heart of our democracy. A central component of this system depends on ministers telling the truth at the dispatch box, at that dispatch box. Indeed, the ability of the legislative to question the executive can only be properly executed if ministers tell the truth at that dispatch box. If they don't, accountability is impossible and we're then we're on a very, very slippery slope. No party, no individual, no ego is bigger than Parliament. It is the very system that safeguards our freedoms and through which we try to create a more prosperous, fairer society, regardless of party. History will be very unkind to anyone who impugns its integrity. Members who are found to have knowingly misled the House bring it, and by extension other members, into public disrepute. This does, this does nothing for the dignity and calling of politics. Indeed, and this perhaps leads to another further point, if some members maintain that we members cannot regulate ourselves, they are in effect asking for an independent body to do that job. The thought of unelected officials regulating the conduct of elected members of, of this House should concern every yeah. parliamentarian. And that is why I think, in many respects, today is a good day, because, as it should be, our parliamentary system itself is putting right a wrong, or certainly I hope it will be doing so. Now, the reason, as we all know, the rule-breaking in Downing Street during the pandemic resonated so strongly with the public is because the rest of us went through real pain during the lockdowns at the instigation and the compulsion of the then Prime Minister. I, for one, and I know there were many others, could not say goodbye to my beloved mother as she lay in hospital and passed away because we were abiding by the rules. And there are many, many people who have similar ex um, um, experiences of that. To find that unlawful gatherings were taking place at the heart of government was bad enough, but this has been compounded by the, then fa or by the failure of the then Prime Minister to be truthful to this House. It is simply not acceptable, and I know that this Chamber will find that to be unacceptable later this evening. Agreeing with the recommendations of this report is thus, in my view, an essential step in restoring standards in public life and to restoring the centrality of truthfulness to our parliamentary system. Finally, Madam Deputy Speaker, to my Conservative colleagues, I would say the last year or so we have spent deliberating on the various aspects of Partygate have served as a massive distraction from the otherwise good work we have been doing on many fronts. It is time to put this to bed, and agreeing this report is the best way of doing this. Dame Margaret Hodge. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. There are moments when we know that our parliamentary debates will form part of our nation's history. And for the wrong reasons, today is such a moment. Mm. Everything that we do in Westminster, whether it's addressing the crises facing our communities with spiralling inflation to skyrocketing mortgage rates, or whether it's about strengthening support for the brave Ukrainians, all our actions, all our words will only matter if we are trusted. Mm. And that trust only exists if we tell the truth.
especially when we are called to account for our decisions. <coughs> Confidence that it, this is a place where politicians are honest and accountable is completely central to the effectiveness and sustainability of any healthy democracy. Yep. Conversely, a culture where lies are ignored, tolerated, or even excused <coughs> is a culture that inevitably damages democracy. And that is exactly the dangerous culture we saw nurtured under Boris Johnson. Mm -hmm. That's why, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Privileges Committee report and its recommended sanctions are so important, and why it is vital that they are supported by everyone in their entirety. I pay tribute to my right honourable friend, the member for Peckham, and to all the members of the Privileges Committee for their forensic and painstaking work, sifting and evaluating the evidence. Mm -hmm. Evidence that might not have been available but for the revelations first made by Pippa Carrera. So mm. I pay tribute to Pippa's work as yeah. one of the most talented yeah. journalists of our time. The committee's conclusions are based entirely on evidence, and that evidence is incontrovertible. The attempt by a few people today to, to reduce the members of the Privileges Committee to delegitimise the process is utterly, utterly shameful. Yep. On that point, I'll write on the way to give way. Yep. I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady for giving way, and I'm conscious that the Chair of the Standards Committee did say we shouldn't make too many comparisons to the criminal justice system. But the reality is, in the criminal justice system, where the burden of proof is beyond reasonable doubt, we ask jurors to look at the evidence and infer, therefore, the actions and intent of the perpetrator. Does she agree with me that it's quite strange that there are some colleagues that are looking for an even higher level of evidence than that? <laughs> I, I think that's a, an extremely interesting point, because as a non-lawyer, I thank her for it. I thank her for it. If it is true, Madam Deputy Speaker, that attempts were made to bully and, yes, to blackmail privileged committee members so that they came to conclusions that were not based on the evidence but prioritised Boris Johnson's own personal interest, that is shocking. The integrity of Parliament must come above all else. It takes courage to stand up against such political pressures. Yep. But showing integrity and leaving party tribalism at the door is absolutely vital if we are to uphold democracy and protect this place from a further erosion of trust. Today is yep, I'm happy to I thank my right honourable friend for giving way, and she makes a very important point about integrity and the perception of this House. I had young people contacting me about this debate, which they are following. Uh, does she agree with me that for a former Prime Minister to lie to the House, lie to the Privileges Committee, seek to undermine the Committee, then threaten parliamentarians who are supporting the Committee's findings, is a behaviour on which we must take a stand in the interests of our constituents and the next generations, and that voting this for this motion today is important that we take this decisive stand on integrity, and it will have impact for generations to come on yeah. confidence in this House. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do agree with my right honourable friend, and I'm also pleased that the Privileges Committee will be looking at the conduct of some uh, members of, this, of both Houses in attempting to intimidate uh, members of the Committee. Today's debate, Madam Deputy Speaker, has to be considered as part of a bigger problem that is facing us. Over the last six years, we have seen consistent attacks on the fragile pillars that act as vital checks on executive power. We have seen judges and judicial review denigrated, senior civil servants sacked for speaking truth to power, cronies appointed to key public positions. Pals rewarded with honours and contracts, attempts to undermine the independence of the BBC, and our Parliament systematically bypassed. Boris Johnson allowed this creeping culture of corruption and unchecked executive power to infect our democracy. So let's not beat about the bush. Boris Johnson did recklessly and deliberately mislead this House. His behaviour helped support a culture that threatens our democracy. Today, I hope we are beginning to undo the damage that has been done. 
We are reaffirming the importance of ministers and prime ministers being properly, honestly and truthfully accountable to Parliament and through us to the public. Mr Johnson was not just called an honourable member of this House, he led a major political party. Mm. He was our Prime Minister, mm. yet he misled us time and time and time again, and he did so with impunity. The members opposite, I have to say, knew this man before he became their leader. They knew he'd been sacked as a journalist for lying. Mm. They knew he'd been sacked from the opposition front bench for lying. They knew he wrote, routinely bent the rules and misspent public money at City Hall. They knew he was a liar, yet they still made the terrible mistake of electing him as their leader. So today, I hope all members of this House, and particularly members on the opposition benches, do not make another terrible mistake by choosing either not to turn up or choosing not to vote. This, Madam Deputy Chief Speaker, should not be about Conservatives versus Labour. Yeah. No. Every parliamentarian needs to look at the evidence yeah. and ask themselves if they can honestly ignore the heaps of information that shows Boris Lord Johnson lied to us all and through us to the people in the country. I would strongly urge every single Member of Parliament to walk through the lobbies and register their vote, a vote for the, for the resolution, a vote that demonstrates our support for truth, justice and democracy. Yeah. Uh, Sir Jacob Rees-Mogg. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, it is perfectly reasonable to challenge the views of select committees of this House. It is neither eccentric nor indeed rare. So I should like to start with some of the things that I think are most contentious within the report, bordering on erroneous. We may turn to paragraph 48 to start with. This makes reference to the fixed penalty notice received by Mr Johnson for the birthday party. And it seems to think that the fixed penalty notice is in fact an admission of guilt. But Lord Chief Justice Thomas, in R. V. Hammer, said this. It is quite clear that the issue of a notice is not a conviction.